All right, guys. Well, I guess I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so my name is Jacob Holcomb. I'm a principal security analyst at Independent Security Evaluators. And today I'm going to be talking to you about attacking patient health. Um, the title of my talk is Attacking Patient Health, the Anatomy of Hospital Exploitation. Um, so again, my name is Jacob Holcomb. Um, I specialize in exploit um, development um, and research, um, as well as application and network security. Uh, since 2012, I've responsibly disclosed approximately 100 zero-day vulnerabilities, uh, most of which have been in IoT devices, uh, specifically routers and network storage systems. And why do I do this? Because I am ultimately a hacker, and security is very important. It's fun. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> um, so really quick, uh, about the company I work for, uh, Independent Security Evaluators. Uh, we're just a bunch of ethical hackers and computer scientists who essentially like to break things. Um, and our customers are anybody who is in need of protecting assets. Uh, our focus is primarily white box as opposed to black box. We prefer as much information as we can get our hands on, so source code for uh, example. Um, and really quick, some research that we've conducted over the past couple of years, some of which I've already mentioned. Uh, the Soho router stuff, um, the network attached storage stuff, uh, was actually pretty cool. Developed a work to exploit those systems. Presented that at Black Hat Europe a couple of years ago. Um, some HTTPS caching stuff. Basically, the assumptions, or I should say, the improper use of HTTP caching headers. So, for example, data may have been received by the client in a browser, we'll use a picture as an example, the proper headers weren't set, and therefore a cache, and that sensitive data resided on the cloud system. A banking statement would be a critical example. And if you're curious about reading any of the research uh, papers, there's a link to um, our company website. Um, I'm also an organizer of IoT Village. Uh, show of hands, who is familiar with IoT Village or Soaps the Broken? Nobody? Okay, great. <laughs> um, well, So Obviously Broken is a Catch the Fly contest uh, that basically was created after uh, we conducted research on several routers. And then IoT Village, uh, I guess, is an area or a, a, a point of interest in which individuals who are concerned with IoT and security of IoT devices can come together and, I guess, make them better. Um, so, why am I here today? Well, security is important. We all know that. You know, we're security practitioners. Uh, but hospital security is really important for multiple reasons. Uh, I mean, I guess the primary purpose of a hospital is to treat and cure individuals. Um, if those individuals are, have some form of illness and they're unable to be treated or they are mistreated due to whatever reason, uh, you're going to experience a lot of issues. Um, so, hospitals are being targeted, um, and we, that it, we have evidence of that, um, specifically the ransomware examples that have been in the news over the past, I don't know, over the past 12 months, I believe. Um, so, medical equipment is being actively exploited, um, and it's very important that emphasis is put on protecting patient health as opposed to uh, compliance-driven uh, reasons, like uh, electronic health records, for example. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, okay, so topics. Um, really quick, we're going to give you a brief introduction of you know, how this talk is going to progress. Um, we'll talk about some exam security aspects, um, as well as recommendations for what people can do, or I guess what the community can do to, um, I guess, better the security of hospitals. So, introduction. Um, our goal of this research was to prove that a adversary in a remote location would be capable of launching attacks to induce harm to patients. So you can think of it as somebody in a foreign country um, attacking a hospital in another country and inflicting harm to a patient. Uh, so whether that is you know, killing them or I guess just harming them um, in any capacity, uh, the result is disastrous and should be avoided at all costs. So, this research, I guess, is a result of our assessment of 12 healthcare facilities, uh, two healthcare data facilities, which you can think of more as a data center, uh, four um, enterprise grade or hospital grade medical devices, and then two hospital web applications, uh, one of which was an electronic health records application. Um, 
And then, yeah, the primary reason for doing this is securing patient health. So, examine security aspects. We're going to talk about a couple of things and I'm going to further break them down. Uh, medical device implementation issues. So, common issues that we as security practitioners encounter when we perform security assessments are rampant in medical devices, and we'll talk about a couple of those. And then, dissection of three uh, real world attack scenarios. So, as part of this research, uh, what we set out to prove was that, again, somebody from a remote vantage point, as well as some others, but specifically a remote vantage point, could induce harm uh, to patients residing within a hospital. So we'll break down a couple of uh, a couple of attack scenarios where we were able to do this uh, in multiple different ways. So medical devices, uh, these are the targets that we looked at. Uh, two of them are currently redacted, um, as we are currently in the responsible disclosure process, uh, but the other two are listed by name, and they belong to General Electric, GE. Um, and they were patient monitors. Um, here is a list of some of the vulnerabilities that were identified within these devices. Um, some common ones would be things like use of outdated software, hard-coded credentials, or default credentials. Uh, but then you get into some more concerning issues like un uh, undocumented user accounts or backdoor users, as well as memory corruption. Um, and we specifically found key memory corruption. Um, so vulnerability number one. Um, Basically, we're going to talk about uh, SQL injection. And SQL injection is the result of uh, data input being placed within a query and then being sent to the database. Um, so we have this medical device, and um, it has a management server portion. And the management server is used as a central aggregation point for data reported by these, uh, these sensors or monitors. Well, in order to ac access this application, uh, you have to provide credentials, username and password. Um, so really quick, I have a screenshot here showing that um, I attempted to log in with the username of Gimpy and a, and a password, three character password of I have no idea what I type, that's irrelevant, but we're informed <laughs> that the username or password um, was incorrect. Actually, it says your name. That's a typo. Doesn't really give me any reassurance that you know this device was designed with security in mind. Please log in again. So we'll start to probe around the device, produce some other errors, and uh, we had found that when we supplied special characters, very interesting things happened. Um, one of which was an error message that produced a uh, a SQL error. So it was a syntactical error. Um, so knowing this, we're like, okay, well, what is like the standard run-of-the-mill SQL injection payload? The OR1 equals one attack. Um, and that's commonly used to um, trick conditional logic to result in uh, Boolean truth and allow you to bypass authentication. So what we were able to do is um, supply an arbitrary name. Um, in this case, I use Gimpy. It's a nickname of mine. Um, and then the OR1 equals one clause with a comment. And that's essentially going to negate the rest of the query and say, hey, you know, a lot of you authenticate if this user exists or one equals one. Well, one obviously always equals one. Um, and therefore, the result of the query was true and uh, we were able to bypass authentication. So upon typing in the or one equals one, um, an AMF, which is action message format, request is posted to uh, the gateway.aspx um, endpoint. And as you can see, our payload is highlighted by the Gimpy 41 equals 1. And the response from the server uh, shows us some interesting information. Um, there are no errors complaining about authentication, as we saw earlier, and we get some additional goodies. Well, uh, once the browser processes this response, we're presented with this level page, and we've effectively bypassed the authentication on this medical device. And basically, we're just able to monitor uh, the vitals of this individual and manipulate them in which could be disastrous. Can you modify the device if you like that? I'm sorry, what? Can you make modifications to the device that you right? Yes, we could. So this is essentially that was a passive device. So there wasn't, it wasn't like an insulin pump or some active device in which yeah. we could actively manipulate it and then have a direct result be reflected on the patient. What we were able, would be able to do would be monitor uh, vital signs um, or other data that may be being monitored to 
I guess we're just we're providing an accurate data, and that could allow for the wrong types of medications to be administered or other things um, of that nature. So the next attack that we're going to talk about or vulnerability is the um, lack of insufficient input validation and output sanitization. Um, that's the vulnerability name. The classical attack that goes along with that is cross-site scripting, XSS. Uh, who's familiar with cross-site scripting? Most of you, all of you, awesome, excellent. Um, so again, quick definition, cross-site scripting vulnerabilities are the direct result of an application taking raw user input. Ironically, I'd say most vulnerabilities stem from taking raw user input um, and then returning that input to the user without proper validation or data sanitization. Uh, an example of validation would be if you're expecting an email address, don't allow somebody to provide you the phone number. Um, sanitization would be um, the data is going to be rendered and displayed to an end user. Um, you're not going to want that data to be displayed verbatim. So if they supplied you with special characters and then you should escape them. Uh, HTML entities would be an example. So this um, example is pretty straightforward. Um, Cross-site scripting, normally you have a URL endpoint that has a parameter. Within that parameter, you're going to specify some arbitrary HTML or JavaScript. And that's going to go up to the server. The server is going to perform some form of data processing and then return that, uh, that input to the user in the form of output. So while I don't have the attack payload on the screen, you can see we have an alert pop up that has the string IC in it. Uh, so what we were able to do was um, essentially input arbitrary data and then get the device to run it. And that data is going to be HTML or JavaScript. Um, and this allows us to do whatever we want. Um, so, as you can see in the background here, we're in the GE healthcare device, um, and with the cross-site scripting vulnerability, any setting that may exist here, we can change it. We're able to manipulate that. Um, so, using the, uh, a client-side attack, where, again, we'd be able to perform some type of disastrous um, attack against a, a medical device that would have a very large impact on the end user, or the user connected to the device. Um, all right, the next vulnerability that we're going to talk about is the failure to canonicalize file paths. Um, by a show of hands, does anybody know what type of attack I may be referring to with that vulnerability without reading my screen? Um, okay, so direct route traversal is the attack that will exploit this vulnerability. And a direct route traversal attack is also known as a dot dot slash attack. Um, what that allows us to do is essentially traverse the directory structure of a given system and access files that we may not be able to access. So again, we're playing with some of these medical devices. We're in the GE healthcare device, and we found this module that they have called uh, View Logs. As you can see here, and there are a couple of buttons that allow us to view logs of different facets of the system. So upon, upon clicking one of these buttons, uh, we eventually see an API request issued um, with a parameter called link name. And the value of link name, it looks awfully a lot like a file path. Um, bar log messages. So, okay, they're passing in file paths. Are we able to manipulate that? I don't know, let's find out. So classic dot dot slash, uh, we quickly bar log, we're gonna go up two directories, so we're essentially in the root, and then we're gonna attempt to traverse back down into the Etsy directory and access the shadow file. Well, a couple of things with this. The shadow file requires root permissions. We aren't guaranteed to have root permissions. So it's very possible that this attack payload will fail, but it doesn't mean that the system isn't vulnerable to dot dot slash or directory traversal attacks. We just may not have the ability to read that specific file. Well, in this case, no, we definitely did. So, we had a directory traversal with root permissions, meaning any file that resided in that file system, yep, we were able to take it and view it, read it, manipulate it, whatever. So, that's fun stuff. Alright, the next vulnerability we're going to talk about is the use of outdated software. And the attack that I am talking about is exploit outdated software. So, outdated software usually lacks the latest functional um, or security level fixes, patches, whatever you want to call them. And ultimately, it leaves your system vulnerable to attack. Um, so it's very important that you patch your systems. Well, let's think about it. Okay, so recently, there was a vulnerability that came out, and it affected the Bash shell. Um, it was 
uh, dubbed Shellshock or Bashbug. And this vulnerability was the result of poor data parsing, um, meaning that a user who was able to supply a function um, definition as a environment variable, um, as well as any trailing text, uh, Bash would, while parsing the or setting the environment variable, would execute that trailing text. Which means we're able to do some pretty cool things. Like, I don't know, define a function that does absolutely nothing, but then runs a command of our choice. Yeah, that sounds like a lot of fun. So why is this important? Well, um, can somebody tell me what types of endpoints um, were affected by Bash or Shellshot? In other words, what were some of the requirements in order to exploit this? Does anybody know? Okay. One of the biggest, CGI, Common Gateway Interface. So that was one requirement, um, or I guess one condition in which a Bash implementation, or a, uh, again, a Bash implementation would be vulnerable to Shellshock attack. So, knowing that the, uh, the medical device, it was the uh, GE medical device, leveraged CGI, um, again, with a view log file, CGI file, uh, we were like, okay, well, this thing may be one of those shell shot. At the time, we didn't have access to the system, so we were unable to verify the bash screen. So there are a couple ways you can do it. You can attempt to play around, fingerprint the device, and see maybe what type of version of bash is on there. That's far more complicated than just attempting to exploit it. Um, so, with some kung fu, or I guess computer hacking fu, whatever you want to call it, uh, we constructed a payload that leveraged, leveraged curl to set our shellshock payload um, as a user agent environment variable. And that is done with the dash a flag in curl. So, what we're essentially doing um, is setting, there's defining a function that does absolutely nothing. And you can see that with the, uh, with the parentheses and uh, the brackets. And then immediately following that function definition, we have the bash.i string. Um, and what that is essentially going to do is be executed uh, once this request is sent to the server because of the way that the environment variables are going to be processed. Um, and this allows us to basically make a connection using uh, the TCP device to the attacker controlling IP and supply that file, that device file, as input to the interactive batch session and then do some uh, input redirection to give us a reverse shell. So, what we did is exactly that. We set up a netcat listener uh, on port 12345, executed our payload, and we received that shell. So now we know that uh, the web server on this device is running as root, um, as demonstrated in the directory traversal attack. Uh, we identified that a outdated version of Bash was in use, and we were successfully ex able to exploit Shellshock, which resulted in uh, remote code execution. So this is one of many ways that we were able to compromise um, these devices. Okay, so attack analysis. Um, I guess, really quick, some of the participating hospitals in our research are listed here, or I shouldn't say listed, they're shown here as dots on the map. Uh, we aren't allowed to talk about them by name, unfortunately, so here is the best I can give you. However, given the location and the dots, you may be able to infer which hospitals we evaluated, but I'll leave that as an exercise to you guys, <laughs> should you care. So attack anatomy number one. What we're trying to do here is crack the hospital, uh, cracking the hospital's perimeter. Um, and we are going to do it from a remote vantage point. Um, so back to what I said earlier in the talk, uh, think of us being a adversary in a different country, attempting to exploit or harm a patient in another country. Um, and how are we going to do that? An external web application. So breaking down the anatomy, uh, we know that there are several steps involved here. One, we want to, we need to circumvent the perimeter of the hospital um, in order for us to actually be within the network to induce harm to the patient. Um, once we circumvent the perimeter, chances are we're going to compromise an externally facing system, like a web server or some form, some form of network equipment, would be a firewall. Um, once we have that access, it's very good, but that's not the end game. Uh, we're going to have to kind of get to the patient. Uh, in order to do that, we're going to have to pivot through the network. And 
From there, compromise the end system, which would be a medical device, and we could do that in many ways, as I've demonstrated, and we profit. So, circumventing the perimeter, how do we do that? Well, as a remote attacker, we know that we want to attack hospital A. We need to identify all of the external endpoints for hospital A, and that's going to be your typical reconnaissance, information gathering, you know, finding all the exposed systems and applications. Um, as stated, this anatomy is going to exploit a web application, so we targeted the external uh, web server and application that we identified. It happened to be a PHP application. Just because it was written in PHP doesn't mean that it's vulnerable. Um, however, every time I see PHP code, I immediately think, oh my gosh, file inclusion, oh my gosh, SQL injection, win, win, win. Um, so you always want to attack it. And sure enough, that application was vulnerable to inclusion attacks, to SQL injection attacks, etc. So this is, a, this is a pretty easy win for us. Um, and then we identify and exploit vulnerabilities. Once that system is compromised, uh, we're able to map the internal network, and then from there, hopefully exploit um, these newly identified systems. And we're going to map them using typical port scanning tools, um, you know, MMAP, custom scripts, etc. And then compromising the end system. Um, basically, once we're on a network, we pivoted through, we identified medical devices, uh, and within a network segment that we needed to reach, now we need to compromise them. And we're going to do so using some of the vulnerabilities that I talked about um, earlier in this talk, um, or by some other means, or through some other means. So here's the attack demo. It's not real world, it's an, an animation, but it will help articulate what I'm trying to say. So, could somebody kill a patient from another country? Uh, the answer is absolutely. Um, and as I decided, or as I uh, talked about, we compromised an internet-facing web server, specifically the application. From there, we were able to pivot within the network, and we gained access to an uh, effective medical device, uh, one of the devices that I had listed on my slides. And then, from that medical device, we showed that we were able to induce harm. Um, and we weren't able to directly um, induce harm as this image depicts, um, as again, these devices that we evaluated were passive, um, so it would take some, I guess, intervening force, such as a nurse, you know, administering the wrong uh, prescription dosage um, to, I guess, induce this harm or inflict this harm. But uh, that isn't to say that the devices that we evaluated couldn't have been uh, an active device, and then we therefore would be able to immediately, I guess, I don't know, I'll use an insulin pump as an example, give somebody a, uh, an overdose of insulin. So, from there we profit, we win. Um, as the bad guy, we broke into the hospital, we gained unfettered access to your systems, and we potentially harmed one or more patients. This is disastrous, especially from the PR perspective. Um, I mean, that's, that's putting aside you know, the health of, of the individuals. So, attack anatomy number two. Um, this is kind of similar to what we had just talked about, except this one is called Hospital Lobby Kiosk Attack. It's kind of funny, kind of cool, because we do exactly what we just talked about from inside the hospital. So it's kind of like we're there while it's happening, you know, IT staff has no idea what's going on, and it's just win win win. So, what we're going to do is crack the hospital from the inside. How are we going to do it? a computer that is accessible to us. Now, there was a plenty of network jack that we were just able to plug into and had unfettered access, but there was something that was almost the equivalent of that, and that was the kiosk. So our vantage point in this time isn't remote, um, it's local, but arguably it's remote because anything that's accessible to users of, let's say, a lobby shouldn't be on your protected networks, right? You would think. Well. So what we're going to do here, again, is as an attacker, we're going to circumvent the perimeter. Um, you can think of the perimeter as kind of more of an abstract thing, uh, like a network, for instance, as opposed to being like the front door of the hospital. Um, again, we'll have to pivot within the network once we've compromised the device, and then we're going to look for an end system, i.e. a medical device, compromise it, and then prop it. So, kiosk. Yes, this is the real picture with the real kiosk. Um, this kiosk here resides in a lobby of one of the hospitals we evaluated. Anybody can walk in and leverage this kiosk to do whatever they want. Uh, the primary purpose is to print out visitor badges. So, what we're able to do is 
hop on to this, uh, this kiosk. We're immediately given the hospital prompt to you know, sign in, uh, but this is known as kiosk mode. So we're completely able to jailbreak out of it. And how we're able to do that uh, was actually rather simple. It just required some creative thinking. So you have the system, it's in kiosk mode, you can't get to a desktop or command prompt or do anything funny. Um, so you kind of start thinking about the technologies involved of how somebody may implement a system like that. Um, a very common thing would be web technology. So it's like, okay, if they could possibly be using web technologies, um, what, te what is their client? Well, the client turned out to be a web browser. So what were you able to do? You can still right click, okay? Right click, view page source. What happens? Oh man, a lovely you know view source window pops up. You know that are, it's available in your developer tools. Well, you go to the file menu, you click Save As, and your little Microsoft Windows Run box or Save box comes up. Something you guys may not know: that Save box isn't just for you to provide input to save files. You can actually access arbitrary location in the system. So what did we do within the Save dialog? We navigated to cd.exe, hit Enter. There's our command prompt. Command prompt opened up immediately. As you can see, there it is. Um, and you can see the save dialog in the back there. So, yeah, we effectively broke out a kiosk mode. Yes! Now what? Well, this machine, again, should have been isolated. It wasn't. We immediately had a domain user. We immediately found out that it was on a protected network segment. Not the network segment that we needed, but who cares? We're now within the network. We have a domain user uh, that we can use to access other systems. So again, just a screenshot showing, hey, you know, we're on the kiosk, and I uh, can't really see it on the projector, but this arrow is pointing to a reflection on me, and it's just me with the visitor band on. Um, and on the system, we had the ability to execute code. So what did we do? Downloaded some utilities, um, showing that we downloaded Putty here. It's an SSH client, and we're able to run it. So this machine is compromised. It's game over. I do want to note that we, at this time we didn't have administrator access, uh, but that was irrelevant. As this machine is our pet machine, we were able to execute code and we were able to execute or access systems and networks that were protected. Um, administrator access to this machine wasn't a concern, just, just pivot into the network, compromise the system with higher elevate or higher privileges, and then use that system as our primary point of entry. So it's win win fun. Oops. Okay, so again, like I said in the uh, prior attack anatomy, um, once we broke in the perimeter, we need to compromise an end system. This end system is going to be additional vulnerable systems or medical device. It just depends on where we are in the network and what amount of effort it takes to get to a segment that contains one of these vulnerable devices. So compromise identify devices. Um, again, here's a demo. This one is another scripted video. So, can somebody kill a patient in the hospital lobby? Yes! <laughs> um, as you can see here, we, we're demonstrating that we broke out of the kiosk mode, and we have a command prompt, and then from here, it's the standard um, attack methodology I've been talking about, pivoting through the network to find vulnerable systems, exploiting those systems to ultimately exploit a medical device to ultimately induce harm to a patient. Um, and uh, in this particular example, one of these systems that we were able to access was a uh, medicine dispense, uh, dispensing cart or whatever, and that's what you see that barcode scanner there. Meaning that we're, we essentially would be able to manipulate uh, the dosage of, uh, of, uh, of uh, drugs being administered. That's very, very bad. Um, yeah. So, attack anatomy number two, profit. It's a win. Um, so we've broken down the hospital now in two different ways. One from a remote perspective, a uh, remote vantage point, excuse me, which could be anywhere outside of the hospital, um, and another from a local, but yet again remote vantage point from within the hospital. Awesome, I love that one, it makes me so happy. <laughs> um, okay, so the next one, the next anatomy we're gonna talk about is social engineering. This is fundamentally different from the, um, the prior two attack anatomies in that we are no longer trying to crack the perimeter, but we are trying to crack the healthcare practitioner. Um, and how are we going to do that? By exploiting the human factor. And what is our vantage point? Who knows? We could be anywhere you know, to conduct various types of SE-based attacks. So really quick, 
Social engineering, uh, the definition is the use of deception uh, to manipulate an individual into doing what you want. And hopefully that's going to give you a shell, because we all love shells. Um, social engineering attack steps. So what we have to do here is come up with a means of performing an SC-based attacks. And you can do a phishing campaign, you can do malicious USB devices, uh, as well as other things. We chose to go with the malicious USB route. So, what you need to do here, bury your infected USB sticks, you need to deliver those malware A sticks, and you have to wait for infection. Hopefully it doesn't take too long, but who knows? And of course, profit. Everybody loves profiting. So, we have to prepare our malicious sticks, USB sticks, and as you see here, this is one of the devices that we actually used. Um, and they're USB rubber duckies, so they're HID devices, and we constructed uh, the payload as well as various, uh, we constructed the rubber ducky payload that included various payloads depending on what we were trying to do. Um, so in this case of compromised the devices, we were able to leverage PowerShell to then download and execute a file of our choosing, uh, which means you plug in this device, it bypasses the auto run, it's HID, system recognizes it as a keyboard, it starts typing in a million words a second, um, and the file is ultimately downloaded, executed, and we have access to your system. So it's less sophisticated, but it's still really cool. Um, yeah, so what we had to do is get these USB sticks into the hospital and put them in within locations that we felt were likely, that they were likely to be picked up by somebody in London. Uh, so we dropped them all over the hospital. Um, public areas, like the cafeteria, as well as nursing stations or any other area that we could get to. And now we have to keep waiting. Waiting, 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 waiting. Um, and within 24 hours, we had our first fish, yes. Um, IT staff? Actually, yeah, we had IT staff, we had healthcare practitioners, and we actually uh, had uh, hospital executives plug in. So it was just pretty incredible. Um, and yeah, a demo of the attack. Another one of these scripted demos. So could a USB flash drive kill a patient? Yep. <laughs> um, so we distributed infected USB uh, drives, as you see here. A healthcare practitioner, and this example is picking one up, um, plugging in the device, and we compromise the workstation uh, using the payload that I described. And again, from here, we are free to pivot through the network. And we're going to do the same thing you know, find systems to exploit, to ultimately find the medical device, own it, to then own a patient. <laughs> so, what's going to happen now? Profit. Three times. Three times the profit. Um, yeah, so that's a lot of fun. Okay, so examine security aspects. We're going to talk about the human factor now. And a couple of things that we're going to touch on are the social engineering, the social engineering experiment that we conducted, as well as the division of responsibilities around the hospital. So, I mentioned multiple payloads. One payload leverage, leverage um, the downloading of a file to execute a compromised system. A, another payload leverage in PowerShell, but to gather information about the, uh, about the victim. So in order to do this, we need malicious flash drives, which again, were HID, human interface devices. We leveraged the PowerShell payload, and then we needed a logging server. This logging server was a PHP web application that I wrote with a custom API and it logged information about the victim. The IP address, the username, computer name, device ID, the device ID which is just the number of uh, flash drive, and then the date in which they plugged the device in. So, what you can see, rubber duckies. Here um, is, I guess, our rubber ducky payload. Um, and what's really important here is uh, this highlighted string. And essentially this string is part of the PowerShell payload uh, that we leveraged. And all we're doing is instantiating um, a web, instantiating um, the, uh, an instance of the web client method, and then we're invoking the download string, uh, met, uh, the download string method of that object to download a file and write it for file system. Um, but in this case, we weren't doing that. We were just calling out to a web server, which is redacted with the pieces of information that we wanted to gather, and. When somebody plugged one of those devices in, it logged on our beautiful server. Here. 
Um, some of this information is redacted, but these are real world results. Um, the IPs, timestamps are accurate, and usernames, everything. So as you can see, some of the usernames that we had there were nurse staff, just a generic user for a given uh, nursing workstation or nurse workstation, um, as well as some other goodies that I wish I could talk to you guys about, but I can't say them by name. So <laughs> just remember, hostile executives, network and systems administrators. So we say IT professionals. We're not talking help desks. We're talking like network engineers here. Um, like very intellectual beings picking up these flash drives and unsuspecting them plugging it in to only realize that, hey, their network has gone. It's something that they've worked very hard to build and secure. <laughs> yeah, they just undermined all of that. Um, and I like to make jokes, you know, because it's kind of funny, but it's, it's really not. Um, and it's like we need to increase awareness to prevent, you know, attacks like this from succeeding because to a degree, um, they're fairly trivial. Like, we're, we're not having to deal with the manipulation of pointers on primary addresses, you know, or point arithmetic to, I don't know, exploit some form of memory corruption, whether it's a use after free, uh, stack stuff for overflow, heat based buffer overflow, where we're prying on uh, the innate nature of humans to trust people. Um, and that's kind of like devilish, you know? It's, yeah. But good things can happen if you're back. Um, so, division of responsibilities. What I mean here is that within the hospital organization, uh, there wasn't a clear demarcation point between help desk and systems engineers or network engineers. Um, meaning that while we were performing these assessments and meeting with hospital IT staff, uh, we actually encountered uh, disruption um, and disruption um, because these engineers. Were, I, I guess these, these engineers were required to do um, the trivial hub desk types of actions, I guess, uh, such as password resets. So um, an individual could be reviewing, I don't know, firewall logs or, or, or whatever, um, and then all of a sudden they receive a phone call and they have to reset, you know, Larry's password. Um, and that really isn't a good thing. If you're the individual for responsible for reviewing, let's say, IDS or IPS logs, um, you know, or reviewing a SIM, um, you shouldn't be resetting passwords. So there's kind of like this, I guess, misunderstanding of what responsibilities fall on what type of IT staff. Um, let's see. Examine security aspects. Infrastructure, architecture, and design. Um, so, a couple of things that we'll be discussing here is the use of outdated software, systems with no malware infections, uh, missing and unenforced security policies, um, undocumented systems, and unregulated vendors. So, the use of outdated software. While performing these assessments of hospitals, um, or healthcare facilities, rather, uh, we identify systems that were running um, Windows XP uh, or Server 2003 on servers. And then a lot of their servers, even if they were running a newer OS, were out of date. Um, this is disastrous for many reasons. One, XP and 2003 are no longer supported, meaning security patches are non existent for them, or any kind of current security patches are non existent for them. So those systems are essentially right for the taking. Um, and then it's, it's very similar to servers that are running newer operating systems but are running you know, outdated uh, software. So this is really, really, really bad. And my next slide has nothing to do with healthcare security, but I just kind of wanted to point out the fact that it's other industries outside of healthcare have the same problem. In some cases, it may actually be worse. Like maybe an airline running Windows 98. Uh, yeah. That's terrible. If that doesn't scare you, I, I don't know what will. You know what I mean? Like when I got on my plane and I saw that, I was just like, do some dive, do some dive. <laughs> Um, another thing that uh, we examined uh, or identified within the hospital are systems that are compromised by malware. So here you have uh, Microsoft Security Essentials, I believe. This was running on a system, and you can see that there was actually some form of detection, there was some form of web-based exploit, um, and it identified these files um, as being the culprits. Um, this was a pharmacy machine, by the way. So the machine handling all your prescriptions and whatnot, yeah, it has malware on it. It's not so good. We should probably fix that. Um, same machine, you can see they have these awesome executables. 
couponprinterservice.exe, and there are multiple instances of this bottle running in the system, all sitting on a network socket. Man, these guys are active shoppers. Um, always looking for the best deals. So that's a serious problem. I mean, if you have machines within a network that are compromised, uh, not only is the integrity of that machine <coughs> compromised, you can essentially assume that the integrity of that of the entire um, network um, uh, segment, segment me, the entire network segment in which that device sits is also compromised. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about is the missing and unenforced security policy. Um, we, I mentioned earlier the demarcation between help desk and you know network or system level engineers. Um, the I guess the requirement for an engineer to reset a password as opposed to a help desk uh, support technician, whatever you want to call them, um, is the epitome of the lack of security or, or non-existent security policies. Um, so what's important here is that a hospital actually has you know, these defined policies uh, that outline and clearly articulate what are the responsibilities of every individual within the IT organization, um, as well as providing adequate training for non-technical personnel. And that's where the security computing comes into play. So, all of this is, is, is exemplified by earlier topics of, of discussion. Again, the use of outdated software, the malware infections that we talked about, and then untrusted peripherals. We didn't talk about those. Yes, we did. People clicking up my flash drives and plugging them in. Um, yeah, so, undocumented systems. Hospitals have very poor inventory controls, as we learn. Um, and specifically, the example that I'm referring to is we performed a MF scan network. We came up with a list of devices, and we actually inquired about one of them um, to a support engineer. This individual had no idea what the system was. It just resides on the network. Furthermore, they had no idea where the system was located. So what did they start doing? Tracing Ethernet cables. <laughs> um, they eventually found it, but that again right there just shows you that you know, undocumented systems can run rampant on a network, and those administrators may have no idea that they exist. What was it, a Novell server that runs forever? <laughs> no, no, I, if memory serves, it was an old Debian server. Um, yeah, I don't recall. Jake, do you recall what the operating system was? Yeah. Um, so, yes. Um, unregulated vendors. So, something that's kind of interesting that may not be made, I guess, abundantly clear to really anybody. I mean, I had no idea about this. Um, is that in a lot of cases, hospitals act in, I guess, act as an ISP in some capacity, meaning that different departments are sometimes third party or they aren't directly related to uh, hospital personnel. Um, an example would be the pharmacy. So we found that pharmacies in a lot of cases um, are networks of systems that weren't deployed or managed by hospital personnel. Essentially, the hospital IT staff set up a means for these third-party departments to plug in their systems and then access the network and resources. Um, so vendors have the ability to deploy systems and software on various network segments. They have, I guess, a lot of control, and hospital IT staff has very little control. Um, the vendors are dictating the configuration of these network segments as well as the configuration of the devices. Uh, which again can poke holes in the overall um, architecture of the network. And overall, hospital staff takes a hands-off approach. The third-party vendor will provide the staff with a list of requirements for them to deploy their system, and the staff will then adhere to those requirements, and then they won't touch it ever again. Um, so from there, once the system is deployed, let's say the pharmacy, going back to that example, they can start making changes to these configurations, adding new systems, the IT staff isn't going to have any idea. Um, and by virtue of this, the IT staff is going to overlook a lot of security issues. Um, an example that we found is some of these systems that were residing on um, network segments that weren't controlled by IT staff, uh, ran software like PC Anywhere, I think it's one, or um, uh, yeah, PC Anywhere is one. Um, what's the name of the big one? Team Viewer is another one. Um, so these were essentially backdoors into a network. Um, 
again, were these put here by those third party vendors or somebody who compromised those systems? Who knows? It's really hard to say. So what do we do about all this? It, it's pretty bad. Um, outside of addressing the implementation level issues in the medical devices that I talked about earlier, like the typical how to address software related bugs, um, the recommendations that we're talking about here are kind of, I guess, the broad. Meaning that emphasis needs to be put on securing the health of patients as opposed to compliance. So what I mean by compliance, EHR, electronic health records, right? Everybody is concerned with that today, is the protection of those systems. And while it is mission critical to protect health data, it's more, arguably more critical and important to protect the health of those patients. Because who cares if you receive, if uh, Joe Schmo's data gets out, if Joe Schmo is dead, right? I mean, obviously Joe Schmo wants to try and keep his information private, but the health and well-being of Joe Schmo is far more important than the releasing of his data. Um, hospital IT staff, they need to take the power back. Um, basically, there needs to be more, there needs to be fine controls over how vendors are allowed to access hospital systems um, and who is going to manage the systems once they're deployed. Um, and threat modeling this is very, very, very important. Um, basically, threat modeling is going to allow you to quantify um, the risk by identifying all of the assets, um, threat actors, and vulnerabilities that may exist within your infrastructure. So this is very important um, as, as you're going to remediate, you know, identify issues, the order in which they're remediated is probably going to be contingent on your risk calculation. So threat modeling is very, very, very important. Um, and then finally, FDA regulations are too strict. And what do I mean by that is all medical devices, as well as software, they have to go through this ruling certification process um, in which a certain set of requirements have to be met. Upon meeting them, their device will be certified, and then any uh, further changes to the device require them to go back through that certification process. It's very similar to the FIPS testing and certification. Um, so what happens, in a lot of cases, the device may be certified. Somebody may identify a vulnerability you know, or some deficiency within the system, and the manufacturer may not address it because that's going to require them to go back to the entire certification process, which could be awfully costly and quite costly. Um, and then finally, fines. Um, if your device isn't compliant and something happens, you're going to be slapped with a very heavy fine. Um, so again, this is deterring individuals from, I guess, patching the software or addressing any issues as they arise. So I, I feel that, I can't, I can't say this for certain, but I feel that if you were to disclose a vulnerability in a device, a manufacturer would try to the best of their ability to keep it on the down low as opposed to publicly, you know, publicly releasing the information to the public with the advisory and then addressing the issue. This is something that needs to change and hopefully, you know, in the coming weeks, months, hopefully not years, but I guess years, this actually happens. So that's my presentation. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. So thank you guys for coming. Uh, appreciate it. And I guess we can open it up to questions. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. How often do you find the workforce with, you know, they just give you HTTP access to a secure network? Um, so we definitely identified a couple of them. Uh, that wasn't the primary thing that we were looking for. And in one of the bigger hospitals that we looked at, they were less common than they were in some of the smaller hospitals that we looked at. Um, so it, it's a hit or miss, maybe a 50-50 shot, but, but they, norm they, do, they normally exist. And if you don't have an open jack, we had found that there are systems maybe like a kiosk that plug into a jack that you could probably just plug into and then gain network access. A lot of them weren't doing any type of device authentication, so you would be able to do that. But you would have a kiosk. Yeah. Just doing device authentication, that would be the resolution for that type of attack? Um, not, not entirely, as a lot of methods can be bypassed. For instance, uh, people will attempt to authenticate devices on the network using MAC address filtering, um, and it's very easy to bypass. So it may deter less sophisticated attackers, but I wouldn't say that it's the solution to preventing the attack in general. Yeah, I was just doing 
I'm, you show a picture of the kiosk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's like it was a very public area. No one in security didn't walk up to you and say, "Hey, what you got? You know, window the dots and those popping up on your kiosk." Yeah, no, no, no. um, <laughs> actually, so the kiosk screen face security, um, and while we're you know, at, the, at the kiosk, right there, are oblivious to what's happening on the screen, and that's right. their day-to-day -day operation is, "Oh, I'm sitting here. I'm checking people to ensure that they have like these, these bracelets or identification badges. I know people are going to be using this kiosk. I only see people using the kiosk. Out of sight, out of mind." Yeah, nobody bothered us, so it's great. Took two hours to print the visitor badge, but it's great. Yeah, right? right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, any other questions? No? Well, thank you guys again for coming. I, I really appreciate it. You know, it's been an honor to speak here. Um, so, yeah, thank you. All right. Thanks.